Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine's podcast series. Uh, my name is Tim Cranton. I'm one of the uh, college lecturers and uh, professional advisors. And uh, today we're talking to uh, a colleague and a very dear friend of mine, Radan Dubrava. We've been on several adventures together, but uh, Radan brings an awful lot of things to the table. He's a very experienced guy, and uh, I wanted to give you the opportunity to hear some of the stuff that uh, that Radan does, and in particular to talk about uh, life as a critical care paramedic, and, and in particular how that kind of relates to remote healthcare, because uh, Radan tends to go to far-flung places to go and get them and, and bring them home. So good afternoon, Radan. How are you doing? Hello, Tim. I'm great. Actually, on the duty today. Weather is fine. We have some minor showers, as you guys in the UK will say, so I'm finally having some quiet time, having my cup of tea. Looking forward for having some few nice minutes with you. Okay, so obviously you're in the, you're in the Czech Republic, and did you say you're on, you're on duty at an ambulance station at the moment? Yeah, at this moment, I'm on duty in the ambulance station uh, for a private company I used to own. I'm in kind of, let's say, rural area, which is like 60, 70 kilometers west of the Prague with the distance to the nearest hospital 40 plus. And all the trauma centers or any special centers are one hour plus of the distance. So it's the nice benefit of the countryside EMS where everything is far, far away. Ah, so you're covering rural EMS at the moment. Exactly. Right. Okay. Well, we're gonna obviously we're gonna have to come into that. I'll I'll have some questions to ask you about that. Um, can you do us a favor though? Can you introduce yourself? Just tell us a little bit about your background. You know, qualifications. What what's gotten you to where you are now, and and a little bit again about your current job and what you're up to. My career was kind of hops and ups and down. Original, I'm an IT guy. I started in the IT company. I was all my life focusing on the security and safety. Uh, all my family are police officers, except my sister. She is a nurse, but all, my father was police officer. My mom was police officer, brother-in-law police officer, uncle police officer. I guess you get it. But on the other hand, in our family, it's like the good, good old tradition of the, we call it the helping, helping jobs. So like you are used to go mm -hmm. working with people and you are helping them. As a security guy, once I got in a situation when one of my very close friends got stuck in the stomach. It was on the security event where was some soccer stadium in the Prague. And I just realized it's kind of tremendous that I don't know how to help him. The ambulance was 200 meters across the stadium, but because of the major event, it took them 15 minutes to get to us. And I realized... I need to focus not just only on the being security guy and knowing how to shoot and fight and all the funny stuff, but also I need to focus on the medicine. So I take my holidays, which I didn't take for like two or three years at the time, and I underwent the basic EMT course by the Prague EMS service, which is one of the oldest EMS service in the in the Europe. And I was cursed. I realized I like to help people. I take the old fashioned way that as an EMT, I was originally driving the, we called Green Ambulance. We were transporting the elderly people from the, from the home to the treatment, et cetera, et cetera. Plus there was some EMS calls, some low priority EMS calls. And I figured out that I like the job. So I kind of switched my career. In between, I spent some time in diplomatic security. I was security manager of one of the five-star hotels in Prague. But in that moment, I was already studying for a paramedic. And in 2008, I went to the military hospital in Prague as an EMT slash soon-to-be paramedic. And after my graduation, I started to work as a paramedic on the emergency department of Central Military Hospital in Prague. That was great skill station because in the army, you know how it's going. There is no nice please be so kind and so on. Okay, there was emergency, there was mass call, there's whatever, you name it, you have to do it. The strict principles of the code and the algorithm, which I really like. I fell in love with that 
dat was my dat was my pivoting point let's say that kind of pivoted me more toward the tactical medicine in 2012 i graduated as a cls in the one of the training centers of the czech army and since that time kind of playing with on the tactical field also at this moment i'm paramedic in the company that i founded in 2011 i sold the company one year ago because i got some medical issues so i was not able to work as an effective ceo so with my partner we decided to sell the company and i stayed in the company as some kind of infant terrible so some kind of guys that's taking the extra shifts where it's necessary to cover also i was spending few years as a dispatcher of the ems uh, in the middle uh, middle bohemia region so emt paramedic and medical dispatch as well exactly wow. certified flight nurse CLS provider, CLS instructor. Hang on, so, and flight nurse as well. Yep. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is there a part time firefighter also? Yeah, that's another part of the story because in Czech Republic there is a big tradition of the volunteering with the firefighters. Especially if you are living on the village or in the countryside, you could be hunter, soccer player, or volunteer firefighter. That's the civic uh, civic unions in the countryside so what was closest to me was the volunteer firefighter so until previous year i was in the rank of if you compare it to professional to the lightning colonel of this era where i used to live mm-hmm. i was the chief of the prevention and planning committee etc etc so. you are obviously you're an active ems uh, person right now as well so you're dealing with pretty much anything and everything, I guess, that that comes into a rural community. Uh, Yeah. 30 minutes ago, we returned from one secondary transport where we were transporting patients with hematomasis and melana. That was just transport in the hospitals, but in 20 minutes, I could be responding to the delivery or major road accident. We have the lucky moment that we have one jail in our area of responsibility. Oh, wow. Okay. Quite often, we are also responding to jail, which brings some Funny moments, you, I am pretty sure that you can imagine what you can find in jail. With the inmate. So for the benefit of, of, of our listeners, can you kind of tell them how, how we met? If I recall it was in a stairwell somewhere. It was very well a lit stairwell and some funny little midget was shouting on us. Uh, <laughs> I uh, hope you don't mean me. No, 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 definitely not. Uh, okay. Well, not somebody. That was in 2014, 13, not sure good friend of mine who uh, was the former chief instructor of the Prague Armed Response Officers by the police, because the closest similarity to the UK system is the Armed Response Officers. All the Czech police officers are, but these are the Rapid Response Unit. So this guy that was the chief instructor and we were training for the active shooter scenarios. And there was the call like, mate, we all need some ambulance. Can you take your time and come with the ambulance? I was like, yeah whatever it would be nice for us to have the experience and so on so i came there with my colleague we spent five six hours working running stairwells up and down working in the dark corridors with the with sfx with the flashbangs all the nice stuff i like and there was some small english guy who was giving the lecture and before i left it's like Hold on, I told to my buddy, hold on, I'm going to ask this guy, maybe there will be a chance for us to cooperate him. And the rest is history, as they say. One of the questions I do want to ask, though, is it is it normal then for medics to be involved in tactical situations in the Czech Republic or or generally? Being a former security guy, air marshal and so, I can see it from the bigger perspective. And it's about the phraseology. How will you define tactical situation? Every call. It's about the tactical situation. When you came to the scene, you have to assess the situation. And it's not just about the bad guys with guns, it's about your safety. If you are responding on the highway, is the traffic stop? If you are responding in industry area, okay, are there any dangerous gases, any chance of electrocuting myself? If you are responding on the farm, are the kettles closed? Because Recently, we were responding to some butcher that was hit by the ox. And, okay, it was about the tactical assessment of the situation of the kettle. It's not only 
about the people with the gun. It's about people, it's about bovine animals as well. Yeah. For example, last year we got uh, one tornado here in Czech Republic. I remember the night before the tornado, I was actually working on the station where I am now, and we got a hailstorm of the uh, and the hail was on the size of the chicken eggs, real big. There was the call exactly in the moment where the hail started for uh, some guy that was being stung by the bees, fifty plus uh, bees stung, mm. and the guy he was the beekeeper so luckily he got some uh, immunity for that but <laughs> it's about assessment the guy is swelling he is going to suffocate maybe but we have to get to him and outside there was flying these big hills so we have to wait we waited for like five minutes after the biggest hailstorm passed away then we drove to the place where he was which was not nice because there was 20 centimeters of ice on the road. The temperature was 27 Celsius degrees, and suddenly you have like 10, 15 centimeters of ice sludge on the road. So it's not just about the medical problem with the patient then. You, you've got all of these other what sounds like environmental factors yeah. that have to deal with too. You have the fallen trees. The rapid response car with the doctor that was trying to reach us managed to get four flat tires because of the most gold. Uh, from the trees, the, the broken branches. You know, my English is not so good as it used to be. <laughs> it was Better fun. than my Czech, remember? Just a bit. And in the end, we have to do what, he, what we did. We load the patient, we rush him to the hospital, okay. Uh, after the night shift, we all went to the tornado area, where it was like mass response. There was like from all the county EMS, which is like 40 agencies, we spent there three days. And why I'm saying all this stuff, that was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On the Monday, there was active shooter in Prague, which is Czech, uh, Czech Republic capital. There was a guy that went to the labor unemployment uh, office, and he took the gun and shot her officer. And then he was walking through the downtown with the grenades. And the location was not sure. So at that moment came the call that all the non-priority calls will be stopped. Uh, all the crews that will be responding in the Prague have to have ballistic equipment. And this all happened in three days. So wow. one day I was responding in terrible high storm. Then I was for two and a half days in the tornado area. And the next day I was wearing my level four ballistic and helmet responding for normal calls in the middle of the peaceful capital city of the Prague. If someone told me, it will happen. I will probably tell them you have to change your dealer or ask your physician to change your drugs. Wow. I think most recently you've also been in another war zone, not just <laughs> not just in Prague. Well, we have the benefit that the Czech Republic is the sixth safest place in the world, according to the United Nations. We have great gun legislation and all the stuff. The crime rate is kind of low. But you remember we have some common friends in the Ukraine since 2014, 2015. And when the war started, uh, sorry, not war, but a special operation, my bad. I was kind of feeling terrible because I was in touch with the guys like two days before I was on the Skype with some friends in the Kiev. And suddenly I saw what was happening on. Some guys that we teach together was involved also. And I wanted to help. So the first one and a half day of the war was terrible for me because I was trying to reach the friends, trying to figure out what to do because it's not easy if you don't have the information. And all these conflicts are a lot about the, the mirage, like what's going on, the fog of war. I'm really happy that the guys that bought the company from me uh, contacted me on the Friday, which was the third day of the war. And he messaged me like, you know, you have some friends there and some of our guys, like the guys that are working with us, our employees, are more than willing to help. So are we going? That was on the Friday, 9 o'clock. I made some calls and at 10 o'clock on the Friday, we got a written invitation letter from the chief of the general staff of the Ukraine army. And on the Monday morning, we were on the way to the Vinitsa, to the military hospital in the Vinitsa with the crew of seven seven guys, which was three paramedics and four EMTs slash uh, firemen, with uh, one standalone trailer, which was like a nine meter trailer 
on let's say row one so we were able to do small surgeries and we were able to take care of four patients at once plus be living there like for living quarters one als ambulance and one mm, shuttle we have loaded about 2.9 tons of medical equipment ultrasounds we did manage to squeeze the x-ray inside but we also prepared the x-ray but it was like 300 kilos so we said like okay we are not taking the x-ray but we take the ultrasound and on the monday we departed and tuesday evening at eight o'clock we were already in the Vinica, starting to provide uh, help to the local guys in the hospital i understand also that you've been you've been repatriating some critical care patients to the czech republic for treatment from ukraine yeah, uh, our company, one of the pillars of our company, the name of the company is Develop Medivac. Medivac was the original company that I used to own, and now the two companies are like joint venture, let's say. And uh, one of the pillars of the company is the repatriation services of the, of the Czech persons that are abroad, let's say on insurance, on the trip, on holiday, and they get insur- they get injured or sick or ill, so we transport them back. So we have the know-how or common friends in the Ukraine, or some or common friends that were on the start of the war, not in the Ukraine, but later moved to the Ukraine, uh, managed to set up the network of cooperating facilities like the hospitals and doctors. And Ukraine medicine or Ukraine medical care is in kind of advanced level. Depends on the location also, depends on if you are somewhere really in the, in the countryside or in some big major cities. But they know how to do it. They know how to treat the patients. But they were short on the resources. And we have to apply the principle of the of the mass, mass casualty medicine or the principle of the war medicine. So do the most for the most people with the least resources. So if we can dispatch our crew from the Prague for a 12-hour trip to the, let's say, Lvov, collect patient, bring him to the Prague where he, they could undergo in peaceful condition let's say, neurosurgical operation, if we can take the family with him, those people will be covered by the Czech health insurance because our country, even though we are in a small country with 10 million people, per capita, we accepted the biggest number of the refugees. We accepted in the peak more than 600,000 refugees. And what was it like in terms of, you know, being able to get to resources? Were you able to use local resources or was it everything that you had to carry yourselves? Mm -hmm. That's one of our principles. We don't rely on our local resources. Uh, you know the 7P rule, so perfect prior planning prevents performance. That's the thing is when you have the list, you prepare the list, and you have to go there, prepare for everything. My role as a, let's say, scout in the, in the Ukraine, I was traveling there most often from our team, was to, with, in the cooperation with the Ukraine guys, to pick, handpick the patients that will be beneficial or transport to the Czech Republic. Plus, so you had to triage patients. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That was not nice experience because sometimes you also have to make the call that there will be no benefit. And I'm still mm. lost have nice memories of this situation, but c'est la vie, c'est la guerre. I understand you've been doing a, a, a fantastic job. I have to say thank you for that. Um, because again, obviously, we both have friends in 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 Ukraine, and uh, I, I know it's very much appreciated that the things that you've been that you've been doing. But obviously, you work as as a critical care paramedic, and you, and like we just said, you've been repatriating patients, you know, back to home countries and stuff as well. You mentioned about you know people going on holiday and maybe having accidents. Can you tell us what was the longest repatriation you've ever done? How long did it take? I know you've traveled across many time zones in one. In right. one setting. Eastward direction or westward direction? You choose. Okay, so I will take both. I will take one case per each side. So uh, you know that I'm situated in the c- central Europe, Prague. Virtually, I'm living in the suburbs of Prague, but it's not so big suburbs now. I'm more in the countryside. Uh, so most distant patient in direction to the west, that was the patient Uruguay. It was in the peak of the COVID season. Always like, you know, go into the medical detail of the patient. It was not so much about intensive medical care, but it was about intensive nursing care. And I was okay. there to follow paramedic. Just to get to the Montevideo and then to the patient means that I have to change the flight four times 
because of the peak of the COVID, most of the flights were cancelled. So it was Prague, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, Montevideo, uh, with terrible time connections. So in the Frankfurt, it was really nice moment because I met some of our common students we teach in the Germany. So they managed to help me to skip the checkup by the customs. So I don't have to wait the queue. So it was like I was checked in 20 minutes instead of one hour. So thank you guys. In the Uruguay, it takes me another six hours to get in the middle of nowhere to meet my patient. Then I spent three days with my patient. In the middle of Uruguay, my Spanish is not so good. So you are like Daniel in Poquito. So it's really funny, but the country is awesome. If you like the green far vistas with nothing else than trees, nothing there was the trees, a lot of cattle, a lot of horses. It's really the country of uh, cowboys. That was fine, but the way back, it was more complicated because that was uh, Montevideo, Madrid, Madrid, Paris. Is this on a private airplane? or We are using the uh, private planes, but on these big distances, it's economical nonsense if the patient is not super critical. So in this moment, we are using the commercial flight. So I was having the benefit of business class. I'm pretty sure that my fellow co-travelers were not enjoying the benefit of me having the patient because the patient was really complicated. Salavi. And it was Montevideo, Madrid, Madrid, Paris, Orly, Shuttle, Orly, Charles de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, Prague. So long story short, it was lovely six days. Wow. Six days to bring a patient from Uruguay back to the Czech Republic. Yeah. Just the flight time on the way there was 26 hours. On the way back, it was 27 hours. Longest trip was 11, sorry, 14 hours over the Atlantic because we managed to get the front wind, so it was more delayed than expected. And in the opposite direction? In the opposite direction, to the Singapore. I like Singapore. If you have been there, it's like Switzerland or the East. I love the place. I love Asian cuisine. So was great for me and that was with a connection flight through the Istanbul and that was the probably most serious person to work on because uh, it was a patient that fell down from the cliff from 40-ish meters in Indonesia then was airlifted from Indonesia to the Singapore. He spent there about one month um, numerous surgeries Unfortunately, they managed to have him. They managed to start to be addicted to the propofol. So he was on the continuous propofol sedation. So ten milliliters of propofol per hour. It's important to uh, to know your drugs then. Yes, and I was happy because I got perfect uh, friend of mine. He's a great anesthesiologist from the EMS. Plus one guy as a uh, also paramedic that used to live in Thailand. So it was good to have guys that have the skill set. Funny part of this was that we were there like with flip flops, seeing our patient, and we do the math. We counted that we need like more than seven hundred mils of the propofol. So they take the plastic bag, loaded seven hundred mils of propofol, and we went to the hotel. Just a friendly reminder, in the Singapore, if you have more than five grams of heroin, you are sentenced to death. I was working with my flip-flops with 700 milliliters of propofol in plastic bag with a Tesco logo back to my hotel and having a good time. It's about not to be afraid. It's about to be responsible. You, obviously, there's, there's cultural sensitivities and things then that you have to understand and know about when if you're going to these countries. That's one thing. I like to travel. I like to talk. I like to learn new things about the people. I have the curse that uh, even though I'm stuck on the grammar, I really fast learn how to speak the language. So it was great to cooperate with guys. The medicine in the Singapore is really on top-notch level. In terms of the, of the interventions that you had to obviously do on this patient whilst they were being repatriated, you've mentioned about Propofol. What what other interventions did you have to do? Uh, the patient had broken pelvis after numerous surgeries. Uh, two vertebrae that were not unstable. Urinal bag, uh, ultra seal. You know, ultra seal. So like for the feces, uh, we have to give him the uh, gastric tube feeding about ten drugs, like pill drugs, every six hours. 
So it was a lot of fun because we were traveling with the normal Ryanair. Uh, it's wide body plane, so you have that uh, two corridors, and the patient is flying on the stretcher, which means that the airlines reserves three rows with three seats, and the seats are folded down, and on top of that goes the aluminium device on which you put the stretcher. It's uh, FAA certified, it's safe for the patient. We have the small curtain that's used to divide economy class and business class, if they have it. In this case, they don't have it. So then comes our toolbox with a lot of tape, a lot of forceps, a lot of uh, creative ideas, a uh, lot of things how to monitor your patient on the 17 hours flight. Plus, obviously, the patient from time to time needs supplementary op- oxygen. So in the end, we made the ICU bed in the back of Boeing 777. A commercial airliner. Yeah, 300 travelers. And even though it's, it was white body plane, so we have these two ACLs, everyone have to go to see the dormitory next to our patient. So just everyone is curious what's going on. You had passengers walking through your primary care site? Oh my goodness. Okay. It was great. I was happy that there was three of us, so we can switch the duties because the transport was 26 hours with a six hour layover in the Atatürk airport in the Istanbul. It was the first week when the new airport was open, so the facilities there were non-existent. So in the end, we arrived. We need to make the hygiene with the operation. We need to provide nutrition. We need to feed ourselves. And there was nothing. So then comes the fixer approach. So you have to take your wallet, miraculously find 100 US dollar bill, and okay, special price only for you, my friend. We need three Cokes and four sandwiches. Wow. And that's it. Only problem is then in the end when you have to put everything to the books. I guess that kind of brings a whole new perspective to a remote location. We always think like in a mountain or at sea or something like that, but up in the air, I guess it couldn't get any more remote. Another patient that was transporting from the Asia, that was from the Bangkok. Well, actually, he was in the Pattaya, visiting the old place and old churches of Pattaya, wink, wink, you know, the churches in the Pattaya, they're really famous. He managed to step on the sea urchin, got a septic, got a stroke, got a infarct, passport was expired. Oh my goodness. Before I sold the company with all the repatriation service, there was all joke that there are three kinds of repatriations. Easy, complicated, and the medevac flights. Medevac was the name of my company. So you name it, he had it. And the patient was in the end like clinically stable. He just needed a lot of oxygen. We got a request for the oxygen. That was another 12 hours flight to Istanbul. Okay, there was oxygen. They bring the oxygen. That was fine. We start to roll the plane. We take off. And it's like, okay, so that's two liter cylinder. So that will be for four hours of the flight. Where are the more cylinders? There are none. Oh. Okay. Then we have a problem because we need to keep the saturation of the patient at least about like 90-ish because the cabin pressure is about 3,000 meters above the ground level. The plane goes up. And especially with the persons after the stroke and persons uh, after the infarct of myocard, you really have to be careful about the oxygen level. But that's the moment where my skill sets of being former air marshal kicks in. It's like, okay, this is white body plane. So hmm, there's another cylinder there, there's another cylinder there, and there's another cylinder there. So you see, there's the order. I ordered enough oxygen. You just give me one, one, two liters bottle. That's it. So we'll take the others. And make it last. That's it. How many languages do you speak? You said you like languages. How many languages do you speak? Czech. One. English, Slova- obviously, very well. Slovak. A little bit. Man kann sagen, ich spreche Deutsch also. So, German. I understand Ukrainian, but I'm not yeah. <laughs> I don't want to offend the guys, but Slavic language is much closer to Czech than Russian. So, you have less than a poquito. So, a little yeah. bit of Spanish. I used to understand Arabic and Hebrew, but it's a bit rusty, so I need to polish those language skills a lot. Would you say uh, language is, is important then when you're handling patients in your care? Uh, there are two important moments of the language skills. If your patient is lying down on the floor and you have a problem, he will do everything to explain you what's wrong with him. So it's a lot about nonverbal communication. That's important part. On the other hand, if he 
at least basically could explain in his native language. It smooths a lot of things. Whereas the important moment of the communication is in the handover of your patients. Many times I have seen requests written like the patient will have these symptoms. In the end, the patient was completely different. It happened to me many times, like, yeah, just go to collect your patient. Only thing that you will need is folic catheter to put a folic catheter in and you can fly him. For Morocco, we, we flew with a private plane, like small jet plane. We came there and the patient was septic, like a lot septic, hyperglycemia. And so like, okay, if I leave the patient here, he'll die. So it's about calling your medical supervisor or the medical dispatch. It's like, okay, this is the condition. That's it. And we made the decision that we'll fly the patient. Uh, I'm not sure if it was Marco or Algier, but we are flying over the Malta and the Italy. I'm not sure about the country, so I forget the country. And we said like, okay, we'll be flying the low-level aviation, which means that we'll be flying closer to the ground. And if situation goes downhill, we'll immediately ditch the plane to the nearest airport. It was more expensive for the insurance company because more fuel consumption, longer flight time, etc., etc. In the end, patients survive without any neurological deficit. So how important to you then is a good patient handover? I think so is the key. We're joking that, let's say, from the States, if you're getting the request, there's no problem to have the medical request for transport of the patient with 200 plus pages. With all the lab results, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. the patients in the ICU, they send you the lab results for 10 days. Perfect. It's okay. I understand that someone could easily write some summary, but if I can check it, the summary is right, that's perfect. It takes some time to dig through the documentation, but that's great. Sometimes I'm not happy about the short version of the medical records because you know how is it like, okay, this is not important, this is not important, this is not important. And I'm not saying that someone is doing intentional, but you can omit some important part. Mm -hmm. Just a little detail, okay, I'll say folic catheter. Is the, is the balloon and the folic catheter filled with the air or with the water? Yeah, makes all the difference if you're going to fly the patient. That's it. Here, we are doing normal with the air. But all the tubes that go inside of the patient, as I said, the cabin pressure is 3,000 meters, which means that everything that's filled with the air will get yep. bigger. Yeah. And these small details could cause a major problem, major problem. Once there was a big uh, request for transport of the children with the brain injury from Colombia, uh, the Bogota is 2,700 meters-ish. It's uh, elevation, yeah. yeah. And in the end, the, I'm not sure if Rega uh, from Germany or some other outside fluid with like big plane, and they make it like with six, seven stops, and the guy have the cranial pressure access. Uh, they got a complete team of the intervention neurologists. They got, like, you name it, there was like 20 guys involved in transport. I was happy that, in the end, I was happy it was not our call because the patient was not so super critical, but, you know, it's rather safe and sorry. Have you ever had to refuse to take a patient? It happened to me many times, like many five or six times, but you have taken into account. That means usually that someone has to pay my time, the hotel, the tickets, the tickets mm -hmm. for the patient. So we are talking about easily, let's say, 10,000 euros. So wow. to make the call, you have to make it with all the information. You have to involve all your supervisors and so on. I certainly found, I think in my experience, you know, I've, I've gone to go and pick up a patient. There's been this sense of urgency from the hospital or whatever, that they kind of just want to get rid of the patient. And then when you turn around and say, I need blood results, I want, you know, the, the readings of all of the monitoring, the trending over the last 24 hours as a minimum, and they kind of look at you with a blank face as if, what are you talking about? And you're saying, I can't leave until I've got all of those things. Because like you just said, you've got to make those calculations when you're flying your patient, patients at altitude, oxygen consumption, et cetera, et cetera. I have this lovely experience with the uh, Greek hospitals. And I have to say, I, I love Greek. I have good friends in Greece. 
a lot of the country, but some of the hospitals are really terrible. I got similar experience with some Italian hospitals, with a lot of French hospitals. Mm. On the other hand, in 2020, I was collecting patients from the London, from, let's say, western part of London, uh, from the IC unit. I just would like to say that I'm happy that we have our socialistic medical care, which is kind of more advanced in the principles of treatment of the patients. I was kind of disappointed. I was really ex- like looking very seriously in the London because it was no small hospital. The ICU, they were not understaffed, but the treatment of the patient was too much uh, binded with the regulations and with all the stuff. And they were forgetting the patient. They call it uh, alarm overwhelming. Like if you're on the ICU, like the alarm is going on instant, constantly. And a lot of mishaps in the medical care, especially in the US, there is uh, some studies for that. Uh, and the injury of the patients are just because the crews are constantly like muting the alarms and not wow. looking at what's going on. Have you ever experienced that? Like, have you ever seen your colleague just muting the alarm and not looking? Actually, I was talking to a colleague most recently who was working in a hospital in Africa. And uh, he was providing airway management for his patient, um, head injured patient. And he was using a BVM, so he's bagging, ventilating the patient. And he was getting good SATs, 98% plus, um, achieving good results. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to transport the patient. So they said, oh, we'll stick him on a ventilator. So it was the ventilator that belonged to the unit. And um, and he was saying that when they switched him onto the ventilator, the, the patient's SATs would drop down to 80%. Obviously, this was challenged. We are advocates you know, for, for our patients. We want to provide them with the best level of care. And the response he got was, yeah, that's okay. It's normal. And it was kind of like, what do you mean? And obviously, they use this, this particular ventilator on a routine you know, basis. And they said, yeah, yeah, you know, Whenever we use this with patients, their SATs always go down, but it'll be okay. And he's trying to say, well, I'm sorry, this is a head injured patient. It's really important for us to be able to maintain very good oxygen you know, levels to be able to provide a good outcome for this patient. And thankfully, he, he stood up, like, like you said, and he challenged the other staff member and said, I'm sorry, I don't think that is acceptable. So they managed to take the patient back off of the ventilator. He found what the problem was, and he actually managed to get hold of one of the consultants and said, do you realize, consultant obviously completely oblivious to it, essentially what they had to do was negate the use of the of the ventilator. And he was bagging, I think he said he was bagging the patient for something like three hours oh. to be able to maintain that 98 plus SATs. So yeah, I guess there's resource poor environments. You've got to be able to adapt. And again, for the benefits of the patient. On the other hand, we got some similar experience, as you mentioned. We're collecting our patient in the Turkey, Antalya. It was really nice equipped IC unit. And you know me, I'm the old school paramedic. So with our head doctor, we came to the department. The only person who was speaking English was Filipino nurse. Everybody else, including the doctors, disappeared immediately. Like, gone, everybody. And the nurse, she was nice. And okay, the doctor was speaking with her. So I came to my patient and I addressed the patient. So, Mr. Doe, hello, my name is... And this intubated patient, even from distance, was not looking great. Uh, on the request for the repatriation, there was like, he was after the left side hemorrhagic stroke and was still having issues with the high blood pressure and over was deteriorating. So it was more that bring him back to die in Czech Republic. So like, yeah, okay. But just not, these results are not giving one and one is not two. Something wrong. The gap in between the systolic and diastolic was really small. Let's say 150 and 120. Why? All the clever guys already know why, but it's like something's wrong. The ETCO, fair enough, more or less. I came to him and I addressed him by the name. This intubated patient that was on the volume controlled ventilation turned toward me and started to chew the tube. Okay. I realized that he got the, how you call it? A pressure sore? Yeah, yeah, or the tube. It's like in check. I was really rude. I immediately shout on our head doctor. He came to me. It's like do <clears throat> a force seat. What's going on? So we take the BVM, switch him over the ventilator. We provided the drugs. We increase the uh, relaxation, and after two minutes, we have 140 to 80 blood pressure. Long story short, this guy was having his private version of hell. Wow. He was not enough sedated for. 
five days. It's like, okay, you cannot very well move. You can just bit move. He was interfering with the ventilator, but in their documentation, they marked him as expected. So mm. that's it. That was a good call and good spot. And this guy, three months after we bring him back, back to Czech Republic, we start on one linear pump. In the end, uh, we was uh, dropping him on the catecholamines and everything. So on the four pumps, obviously intubated, ventilated. These guys, after three months, with the sticks, walk from the department. Wow. That was probably my best uh, moment of carry because this guy was seriously were going there to bring him so he can perish close to his family. It's like, nope, this guy is not going to die on us. So uh, we're flying with small Cessna Mustang, which is really small plane. Tables are like 20 centimeters to 30 centimeters. And I was like small chemical, only mixing all my drugs, everything. And also, we are not able to fly the high-level aviation, so we flew a low-level aviation. So it was Turkey, Greece, Greece, uh, Slovakia, Slovakia, Prague. It was in the winter, so it was great because in the Turkey there was about 30 degrees. In the Slovakia, there was snowstorm. So again, you have to think about the comfort of your patient, also of yourself, because you have to equip for that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for talking to us this afternoon. I, I know we could talk for hours and hours. You have so many stories and there's, there's, a, there's a wealth of experience there. If you could offer um, two what we would describe as pearls of wisdom for anyone wanting a career in remote uh, and austere medicine, what would they be? Wow, that's a tricky question. Definitely one of them is never stop learning. And it's not about being all life students, having like 20 bachelor degrees and so on. But you still need to keep with pace with the medicine. Mm -hmm. Myself, I'm paramedic for 14 years now, ish. Uh, I'm working in the medical field since 2004, five, so 16 years now. And even in that time, I can see the medicines kind of change. Mm. That's important part. So never stop learning. And one like take home message, I always say to my students: only wrong question is the one that you don't ask. Never be afraid to ask. Yeah. Never say that you have done or checked something that you have not done. I have seen it unfortunately many times, especially with the hand over the patients. Like, yeah, okay, he's just bleeding from the hand, and that's it. We have checked everything. Because, like for example, the helicopter came so fast that the first responder didn't have the time to check. There is no shame to say like. Sorry, guys, I was so much focused. I was checking just this. I haven't got the time to check the rest of them. For example, with the CLS, Combat Life Series guys, they're not so super skilled like medical person, so they could kind of get too much focus on one moment and lost the big picture. So there is no shame to say, like, I didn't check this. I haven't done this, this, this. Being honest. You can be. You can put a BS and the next person will be like, yeah, that's already checked. It happened to me uh, when I was working in the hospital uh, one of the patients that was transported to me got a tourniquet on. We have like more patients on. The tourniquet was not properly put on and not secured. And the tourniquet was not mentioned in the handover. The patient was waiting in the corridor, plenty of other patients. And I was walking beside and I heard like the drops. I look on the patient and I realized that he had a loosened tourniquet on his leg and he's bleeding. He was not like super unconscious, but he was like sleeping. So mm -hmm. he won't tell anybody that he was going downhill. And that's it. If there will be in the tourniquet, okay, there is a big femoral injury. These mistakes could cost someone life. So that's it. If you don't make something, there's no shame to say I haven't made it, but don't make up something. If I was a, a, a brand new person, new to, to, to medicine, listening to somebody like like yourself talking and i'm thinking to myself wow that that sounds like that, that could be a, a really you know interesting career path is there any advice that you could offer to anyone who wants to come and work as a remote healthcare practitioner like you especially with the medicine it's important to start with the basics now in czech republic you can start as a paramedic so you can go to the university for three years and you are a paramedic without any further medical education when I was doing it, it was education in between the uh, high school and university, so it's college, right? So uh, my degree is a paramedics from the college. 
Before that, I was the EMT. It's always good to start like stepwise. First, you need to learn to crawl. Then you can re- you can learn how to walk. Then you can learn how to run. That's it. Even the basics of, let's say, loading the patient, handling the stretchers, all these parts are really important. I have seen so many people tipped over with the stretchers, uh, falling down on the patients, dropping their patients, just because they don't have that four years of loading 20, 40, 50 patients a day background. That's the way how it used to be. Now everyone, everyone wants to go like really fast, like immediately I want to go save the lives and so on. But the work of the paramedic is more about the treatment of persons that are chronically ill, uh, not taking the medication, forgetting to have their medication, etc., etc., etc. So the true emergency goals, like like major injuries, resuscitation, strokes, and so on, that could be like 10% of the goals. But you know what? Every time you are on the like, trick call and the call goes well, and you success, that's the moment you have to take. And my last principle that I have, I'm treating all my patients the same way I would like someone to treat my mother when they will be killed. That's my core principle, and that's it. No matter if it's like drunken addict, no matter if it's like a homeless guy, all the people deserve some dignity, and all people deserve to be treated. Thank you. Again, Thank you, Radan de Brouwer, for, for joining us this afternoon. To our listeners out there, I hope you've in, enjoyed the, the conversation that I've had with Radan. Radan, I'm going to say cheerio for now. I'm going to end our call so you, you can get back on shift and do whatever it is that you've got to do. But again, seriously, mate, thank you very, very much for joining us this afternoon. More than welcome, mate. Bye. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine Foundation. If you would like to earn CPD credit for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CPD credits, free access to the virtual field guide, and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on the college website, which is quorum, C-O-R-O-M, quorum.org.